Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the games start so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Sports Grid. What he's doing on a five-day basis, and when he pitches at that ballpark, if there's one thing you notice, there's not one empty seat. The excitement he's brought to that city and the fact that fans are starting to come back, especially on the nights he pitches, I mean, it, it is so cool to see. It's so overdue, and you can't help but root for Pittsburgh. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on Sports Grid. You mean to tell me Kevin Durant could just get a free trip and Jalen Brown telling y'all I can play? Y'all won't put – what they got to get, they will not put Jalen Brown on this team. They'll give them who get hurt. He's an NBA professional billionaire superstar player. I feel like this is just an opinion. The Olympics should be about Olympians, not about pros that come to represent as Olympians. Only on Sports Grid. Welcome you to hour number three, our third and final live right here on this Thursday on the early line on Sports Grid. He is Donnie Wright's side. I am Ben Stevens. A ton of baseball here in this final hour. Our guy, Craig Mish, five days out from the MLB trade deadline. Our MLB insider joins us up next as we touch them all for another rendition of the daily basis. We'll have the Diamond Dash, some daily Donnie plays, and we'll hear from J.J. John Yastrzemski, with New York, New York, the state of New York baseball in the Big Apple following the Subway Series this week in the Subway Series this season, dominated by the New York Mets. DRS, a baseball final hour before we send you into the money line once again on this Thursday. Yeah, and also a lot of afternoon games, 12 o'clock, uh, two games at 12 o'clock, one game at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, then 7 and 9 o'clock. So you're going to get a lot of afternoon baseball action today to sort of yeah. jazz it up. So I'm here for it. Not a huge card, but a Ooh. decent card, and we love to see afternoon action. So good stuff. Just eight games today in MLB, yeah. six of those in their local time zones in afternoon and daytime baseball we continue the conversation around the american league what have you done for me lately well if you're, you're the the yanks excuse me you got swept in a two-game subway set against the new york mets if you're the baltimore orioles what a gift the mets making the yankees a little brother in the big apple except you keep losing to the marlins and the fork has been long gone with the astros now in first in the american league west are we buying into the bad guys in the AL? What is the best bet as of this moment right now in Major League Baseball to win the American League pennant? That was the question to you and Faye the Public. So, DRS, those are the three best prices as of this moment. The Yankees remain the favorites, plus 250. Only a half dollar behind. Baltimore, a one and a half game lead in the American League East, but not really taking advantage to extend the margin even more. The O's the second best price in the AL pennant prices at three to one. The Astros now sit alone in third with a six to one number. The Guardians not all that far back at this moment with the best record currently in the American League at seven to one. The Twins even sandwiched in between at plus 650. So what is the best bet? 
to win the AL at this moment. As we look at what the public had to say at SportsGrid on Twitter, it's the Orioles in a landslide getting more than 56% of the vote. Get to the Orioles in a second, but I still voted for the Yankees because that's the way I've been going for the past two to three weeks at this point. Now, also, you have the ultimate opt-out clause at the trade deadline when that comes up to see if the Yankees do make a move and or get some of their players back and just, quite frankly, starting hitting. Because a team that has Juan Soto and Aaron Judge on the same team, everybody in that lineup should benefit. And right now, they're going in the opposite direction, which is a really bad sign. The pitching staff that you're waiting, hey, good start, bad start out of Rondon. You take a look then at Luis Heal. You say, okay, maybe he's back into the equation and looking like he's the pitcher that we thought he was at the first half of the season. But Garrett Cole is a monster linchpin. Now, if we are taking a look at the Yankees and the Orioles, I can't fault the people out here in the public 56% of the time right now with these votes coming in on the Orioles. Why? Because if I look at roster construction as it sits right now, that one through nine is way better on the Baltimore Orioles. The pitching staff, quite frankly, yeah. just as good, probably better overall than the Yankees. So yes, the three to one price as opposed to the plus 250 price right now, I can see why the betting public is doing that. Now let's see what happens next week because we had Craig on and what happens if the Orioles finally say, hey, let's go all in. We'll get Tarek Skubal here. We'll peel crochet away from the Chicago White Sox. We're going to make a headway, which then also means you got the better player and kept them away for the Yankees, and that gives you that extra thought process down the stretch that maybe you are the better baseball team here from August into September. But for my money right now, I'm still keeping with the Yankees, but I got to tell you, it's not as confident as what I was talking about two weeks ago. Like, hey, they'll get it together. They'll be just fine at this point. I don't like what I see out of the Yankees, but that could change quickly by, number one, the roster just playing better, and number two, some reinforcements next week at the trade deadline. I will say there are many at this network, maybe our producer, Joe Frizo, the host of Carver and Lisi, of course, also there on Pharrell Coast to Coast, Mike Carver, that are not happy with Aaron Boone and are calling for his job. They will never reach the mountaintop as long as Boone is the manager, specifically referencing a quote Aaron Boone had after getting swept in the Subway Series this season by the Mets. He said, quote, one of the things I really liked tonight was how hooked up we were in that dugout in the eighth and ninth inning. Interesting to kind of try to find that silver lining after losing all four games this year in the subway set to the New York Mets. Of course, as you look at the American League, it is incredibly fascinating at this moment. Can a team out of the Central actually contend for the pennant? You would expect as of this moment at least two teams from the division to be in the American League postseason. And the Royals have a game lead over the Red Sox for the third and final American League wildcard spot. We might see half of the six AL postseason bids come from the American League Central, not the division we expected to be in that position entering this season or even halfway through. And every team in Major League Baseball has played at least 100 games throughout the this campaign so we are nearing what we would consider the home stretch of a long 162 in mlb donnie are you buying in on the astros price at six to one to win the american league pennant now with a game advantage in the american league west have you seen enough are the astros fully back they were the preseason pennant favorites in the american league they have made it to at least the last seven american league championship series Is it worth buying back in on Houston? No, I'd rather buy back lower in that division, which doesn't mean the Seattle Mariners. I'm complete. I've never put it this, put it this way, Ben. I was never in on the Seattle, the Seattle Mariners, but That's I'm true. certainly not going to you buy in now, and I'm basically going to be out on them altogether. But I do find that interesting. We were just talking about a few short days ago. It felt like, ah, Rangers five games back. Check the standings. Three games back. Viable now. Good point. You have two full months of the Major League Baseball season and an unbelievably talented roster that, correct me if I'm wrong, did win the World Series last year. So I, a shame for me because sometimes you say, hey, you know, we have a fun team to watch. I missed out on the unbelievable prices for the Rangers, which, quite frankly, in one we could get those back by dropping five and six games back and not really being a viable contender, as I think they are. But everybody from that top Rangers, Mariners, and Astros, they are going to duke it out down the stretch here. So for me and my yeah. money, I'll just take the longest shot here because would it be amazing? Like, Never would I think the Rangers could make up three games in the AL West over the final 60 days. Absolutely they can do that at this point. It's the same way the For Houston sure. Astros, 12 and 13 games under 500. Dead and buried, as I was saying. They could never come back. 
here they are in first place now in the AOS, something I didn't see coming. And particularly, if maybe it would be in late September as they finally made that charge, they erased that mountain very quickly. So give me the Texas Rangers as opposed to the Mariners and the Astros here as the longest price with maybe a legitimate chance to win that division. The Rangers absolutely hammering the White Sox 10-2 to the final yesterday in Arlington, as any team should when playing Chicago. Ten runs given up yesterday, ten consecutive losses for the White Sox, 50 games below 500, 27 and 77. It is bad for Chicago this year. What was the Rangers' price last week? 50 to 1 to win the AL pennant, 35 to 1. It's now 24 to 1 right now on Texas. And as we have said, the Rangers have a better shot of being an American League playoff team by winning the division. They're only three games back of Houston than they do of being a wild card team, five and a half games out right now of an American League wild card spot. Donnie, this kind of went under the radar yesterday. Yeah. Would love your thoughts on it. Reporting from Bloomberg, okay. Wells Fargo plans to take its name yeah. off of Philadelphia's sports arena, the Wells Fargo Center, where both the Sixers and the Flyers play. Yeah, no love loss. It's not an iconic name. Like if it would have been Lincoln Financial Field, which has been in place since 2003, and that changes, that would be landmark. Yeah. But Wells Fargo Arena Center, whatever you want to change it to, First Union Center but, used to be, the Core State Center. Yeah. It's been multiple names already. But there was a report that maybe the Sixers are going to Camden, New Jersey. Would that actually make your life better? No, no, it wouldn't. Like, there's other places okay. in uh, southern New Jersey that'd be a little bit more feasible to get to. So, yeah, keep it in Philadelphia. Always looking for you. Craig Mish, our MLB insider, joins us now. As of July 22nd, we start a new deal with a monster distribution platform called Sports Grid. And we'll be live every day on national radio on Sirius XM channel 159. And we will be live on their national television uh, platform every day from 10 a.m. till noon. Only on Sports Grid. If this wind like we have out of the Northwest was here all week, uh, was here, it would be insane watching these guys play in it. But it's going to be a Southwest wind, which makes it a little easier uh, as far as the direction of the wind. The guys um, will have it a little bit of a break on the back nine. But it is such a fun golf course, one that I really do think tests every single aspect of your game. Only on Sports Grid. Sacramento with the King, Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, Devin Carter, who they drafted early, Keegan Murray as well. A Kings team, DRS, that has been a playoff contender. Is it going to equate to a championship? Probably not. That's not the goal. Make your team better every offseason. The Kings definitely got better with that move here, Ben. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Less than a week out from the Major League Baseball trade deadline. Everything that happens over the next five days have an interesting additional wrinkle to it, which leads perfectly into our Major League Baseball insider, the host of Newswire, starting at 11 a.m. Eastern time. That is Craig Mish. Joining us here on this Thursday to go all around MLB. Craig, as always, thank you very much for your time. 
Yes, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. In fact, on this uh, segment today, we're going to go over every single trade that has happened over the past few days. I can't wait to dive in. Mm. <sighs> that would be zero. But the speculation, Craig, does not stop here over the next few days. All right, time to round all of them. Touch all four. It's time for the Daily Basis. Craig! <laughs> Always keeping us on our toes, throwing in the Joe Lisi, Craig, when the time feels right. Craig, as we look at what has happened this week and this season in the Subway Series between the Yankees and the Mets, dominated by the Amazons. Four games, four victories over the Yanks, booked as an underdog in all four. What does it tell you? about where the two ball clubs in the uh, Big Apple are this season with the Mets sweeping the Subway Series against the Yankees this year. Oof, I would not uh, want to go on social media or go online today. I mean, you're seeing it all. You know, fire Cashman, fire Boone, fire right side, fire everybody. Mm, I mean, what? it's all mm. out there. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, you know, I, we talked about this probably a few weeks ago. And the season is very long. And I understand, look, the Yankees are playing their worst brand of baseball all season. And, and But again, you know, they did the same thing last year. They had a period of time where they couldn't score any runs. They didn't make a lot of adjustments to their roster. They're very fortunate that they got off to the start that they got off to. So therefore, in the end, they're going to be in the postseason picture. And my guess is they'll add some pieces. And guys, they're going to win their 88, 90 games, whatever it is. And, you know, probably going to get knocked out in the first or second round, which is what I thought would happen at the beginning of the year anyway. Now, the Mets, on the other hand, let's give some credit before we take down the Yankees here. I mean, this was a very big uh, series for them. They split their four-game set with the Marlins coming out of the break. Some speculation, ah, maybe the Mets are going to sell. They're not so good. I don't know that they're going to buy anything, guys, but the Mets have put themselves firmly in the race for the wild card at this point, which was not something that people thought would happen at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I am impressed by what the Mets are doing. You're right. Right now, they would be in the playoffs. We'll see if they make some moves at the trade deadline. Other moves being made across Major League Baseball. And the headline that I think the New York Post had, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Alex Cora extended by the Boston, by the Boston Red Sox for another three years here. Good move, bad move. And also puts that eye now on Aaron Boone. Should he get re-upped as well at this time? Yeah, well, look, Cora, w without question, is a very good manager. And, and I'm really happy to see this because he has gone through it from being at the top to being at the bottom, being in the middle. He's been through different general managers, and they've tried to do things a different way. And he seems like a very good stabilizing force. Every manager in the end, Donnie, is only going to be worth two or three wins, I think, over the course of the season. It's not going to be <laughs> a lot more than that. But he's one of those guys that just is very even keel and has done a great job, I think, since taking over there. And so I'm happy to see him extended and uh, was, you know, a, a marginal player, I would say, at best in the big leagues, but a phenomenal manager. And I don't I think he'll be in it for the long haul with them. As far as Boone is concerned, we're going to judge this at the end of the year. I don't think anything is going to happen right now. So I, I guess let's see, you know, how far the Yankees go. Uh, if they make the postseason and get bounced in the first round, I think they'll probably make a change. I think that's fair to say. But as we've seen, he's been through this before, has Boone. Uh, you know, lots of yelling and screaming, lots of winning, some losing. And then in the end, he ends up, you know, fighting to live another day. So I, I think that'll probably happen at the end of the year. Boston taking some knocks since the All-Star break. They were swept over the weekend in Los Angeles. Lost a midweek set to the Rockies this week at Coors. Colorado scored 20 runs yesterday at Coors Field at Mile High against the Red Sox. Now we go to the top team in the National League Central. The Milwaukee Brewers in one of their stars offensively. Reports late last night that Christian Yelich might require season-ending surgery mm. on his back. Craig, is that going to happen? What's the timeline on Christian Yelich? And if his season is already coming to a close, how does it change your outlook on the Brew Crew? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I know from uh, Yelich's time with the Marlins that this is not surprising nor unusual. He's had back issues over the course of his career. And there are some people that think that we've already seen the peak with him winning the MVP when he was traded from Miami to Milwaukee, he had a couple of back-to-back -back incredible seasons, and then the back issues have, uh, you know, come in again. Now, the one thing that I'm not positive about here 
is at least from you know seeing the quotes from from Yelich on this is he just supremely frustrated that this has happened again to him or is this serious enough where it's worse that he has to have the surgery I don't know the answer to that so I don't know if this is mm-hmm. like a knee-jerk reaction or if legitimately it's a worse injury than he's had in the past generally guys he's missed two to three weeks and then he's come back and played uh, I don't know if that's going to be the case this time around. I kind of find it hard to believe that he it would not be around for September or October, but at some point it does seem like he's going to have to have some sort of surgery. Yeah, it could be bad news there for the Brewers, but some good news here for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Clayton Kershaw coming back to the mound today to pitch for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Craig, what are the anticipations here for Clayton Kershaw moving forward for the Dodgers? Yeah, probably five innings today, but this reminds me a lot of, I don't know if you guys remember this, back in like the 2000s where Clemens would just come back for Houston or New York like halfway through the year, June, July, pitch the rest of the season, go into the postseason. Honestly, I could see Kershaw doing this again next year where they're basically limiting him to 10, 15 starts and hopefully help in the postseason. I I would temper the expectations right out of the gate. This is not Paul Skeen's (laughs) pitching today. Kershaw... Uh, is this is his last year or next year will be his last year but certainly I think against the Giants today you're looking at maybe 85 pitches you're looking at five innings and hopefully a close game Giants uh, hitting the ball a little bit better lately that's for sure Mm -hmm. Clayton Kershaw turned 36 years old in March today will be his first outing in what is year 17 of his major league baseball career dating back to 2008 all with the Dodgers. Craig Mish, we appreciate the time. We'll see you in about 40 minutes on Newswire at 11 a.m. Eastern time. I'm sure you might look rather studious today on News. Mm. More MLB plays coming your way up next. As of July 22nd, we start a new deal with a monster distribution platform called Sports Grid. And we'll be live every day on national radio on Sirius XM channel 159. And we will be live on their national television uh, platform every day from 10 a.m. till noon. Only on Sports Grid. If this wind like we have out of the Northwest was here all week, uh, was here, it would be insane watching these guys play in it. But it's going to be a Southwest wind, which makes it a little easier uh, as far as the direction of the wind. The guys um, will have it a little bit of a break on the back nine. But it is such a fun golf course, one that I really do think tests every single aspect of your game. Only on Sports Grid. joins that team in Sacramento with the King. Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, Devin Carter, who they drafted early, Keegan Murray as well. A Kings team, DRS, that has been a playoff contender. Is it going to equate to a championship? Probably not. That's not the goal. Make your team better every offseason. The Kings definitely got better with that move here, Ben. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid social media accounts have been telling you it's time for some best bets and baseball breakdowns for the last 24 minutes. So here we finally are. Only an eight-game Thursday slate around MLB in a game this afternoon in Los Angeles. The fourth and final game of a set 
in the California rivalry between the San Francisco Giants and the L.A. Dodgers. You heard it from Craig Mish, what he expects and anticipates out of Clayton, Clayton Kershaw in his 2024 season debut. The Dodgers a favorite at minus 142 on the money line. DRS, the Dodgers took the first two games of this set. They had won five straight following the All-Star break. Yesterday, their first loss, San Francisco victorious, 8-3. to three. Who wins game number four, and what do you think we see out of Kirsch? Should be an interesting one, and sometimes it's just about the hitting environment that you're going to be playing in. Now, this game is 4-10 Eastern, which means 1-10 out on the West Coast. That marine layer won't be there. And sometimes you're like, oh, it's just going to be nice in L.A. 93 degrees at first pitch with close to 10-mile-an-hour winds blowing <laughs> out. That should help the batters in this game. Now, Logan Webb has been really good this season for the San Francisco Giants. If we just take a look at his, even his last 60 days, a 79 XFIP minus and a 3.15 XFIP number. That's fantastic. And here's what you also have to watch out for. Webb has been really good, as I said, but that Dodgers lineup over the past 30 days against right-handed pitching, way better than what it has been against left-handed pitching. You take a look at Teoscar Hernandez, who's ripping the cover off the baseball, only a 143 ISO power number. You take a look at Andy Pajes, an 092. Outside of that, everybody is elevated. So including Pajes and Hayward, they're the only two guys below on weighted on base percentages here. That's a really good presenting lineup here for the Los Angeles Dodgers to go up against Webb. The question marks, as always, are going to come into what are we getting actually out of Clayton Kershaw? Healthy and ready to go, five to six innings pitched, one earned or two runs or less, then you're going to be in this ballgame. But for my money today, it's not a fade of Clayton Kershaw. It's just saying to myself, I got Logan Webb on the mound. I pretty much know what I'm getting out of him. As long as the bats don't go crazy for the Dodgers, I think the San Francisco Giants can get a couple runs off Kershaw. So I'll take the short plus money price here on the San Francisco Giants today. Donnie, I think it's a really sound strategy. You've got the ace for San Francisco in Logan Webb. You've got Clayton Kershaw in name, but how Mm -hmm. long will we even see him in this outing? What exactly does that look like here to start year 17? The Dodgers have been great since the break. Victorious, of course, in five of six. Keep an eye on a couple of hot bats, by the way, for San Francisco. Elliot Ramos has been sensational. A couple of RBIs yesterday in the eight-run affair for San Fran. Tyler Fitzgerald also had a streak of five straight games snapped yesterday. A home run in five straight, but still got a couple of base knocks against the Dodgers. Can the New York Mets... Keep it moving after sweeping the Subway Series this season against the New York Yankees. The Mets make the quick trip back from the Bronx to Queens to host the Atlanta Braves. The Braves had their second game of a doubleheader yesterday at home, rained out against Cincinnati. So for the third consecutive day, Chris Sale is supposed to to start a baseball game. Atlanta, an ever so slight favorite with the National League Cy Young favorite Chris Sale on the bump at City Field. One would think that probably helps you out as a pitcher getting extra time off, but sometimes they're just used to throwing every five to six days at this point. Now that's no longer the case. However, if you see that seven and a half number, you talk about the Braves, you always initially want to go under. Chris Dale's been very, very good this year overall. The Mets over the past 30 days haven't hit left-handed pitching all that well. And that just means any lefty, not maybe the best lefty right now in the National League for certain. You take it over and you take see what the Atlanta Braves have to offer at the dish. It's not much here. I do think um, in a lot of right now it's Kalanick, Alvarez, Ozuna, Olsen, and Duvall but I do think I did see that O'Reilly I want to say was activated off the paternity list for today so he should be back in that lineup maybe to help them out. Oh. Severino's not a great pitcher by any stretch but it seems like every pitcher that goes against the Atlanta Braves can have a great outing here. I do think the Mets overall the better team but I'm more likely to say to myself I'm going to get a healthy rested Chris Sale and a bad lineup for the Atlanta Braves in a division duel. I'll just lean on the under at this point. One of the two games of this eight-game slate that are in the evening hours, seven and a half the total. San Diego looks for the sweep in the first baseball game of the day, starting a little bit after noon in the nation's capital against the Nats. Dylan Cease on the bump. The Padres a hefty road favorite. Will it be a perfect three for three against Washington this week? Yeah, I want to go over the total because, like, hey, look at that. Patrick Corbin's on the mound. But as you say that, Patrick Corbin's been okay against right-handed pitching over the past 30 days. But take a look at that Padres lineup against lefties as a whole. Arise <laughs> has been great. Machado has been great. Camposano has been great through three at-bats. That doesn't count. Everybody else has been terrible. Tough game to call, but again, and they got to do it. This seems like an under to me. San Diego scored 12 yesterday. Luis Arias, a couple of RBIs. Jerickson Profar, a couple of RBIs. Kyle Higashioka, 
three ribbies yesterday. More Iggy. baseball with a New York emphasis next. As of July 22nd, we start a new deal with a monster distribution platform called Sports Grid. And we'll be live every day on national radio on Sirius XM channel 159. And we will be live on their national television uh, platform every day from 10 a.m. till noon. Only on Sports Grid. If this wind like we have out of the Northwest was here all week, uh, was here, it would be insane watching these guys play in it. But it's going to be a Southwest wind, which makes it a little easier uh, as far as the direction of the wind. The guys um, will have it a little bit of a break on the back nine. But it is such a fun golf course, one that I really do think tests every single aspect of your game. Only on Sports Grid. Sacramento with the King, Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, Devin Carter, who they drafted early, Keegan Murray as well. A Kings team, DRS, that has been a playoff contender. Is it going to equate to a championship? Probably not. That's not the goal. Make your team better every offseason. The Kings definitely got better with that move here, Ben. The early line, only on Sports Grid. So after a Subway series, this season goes all to the Mets. We have a reaction here on this Thursday morning on the early line on SportsGrid. From one of the best to do it in the Big Apple, that's John Yastrzemski, the host of New York, New York on the Ringer and Spotify, covering baseball in the greater New York City area for SNY as well. JJ, we appreciate the time. Thank you for being with us here live on this Thursday on the early line. Guys, my pleasure. Uh, as one-sided as it gets with the Subway Series, uh, full-fledged butt-whooping by the New York Mets. No question about it. Four games between the Yanks and the Mets this year. Four victories for the Amazons. Two first up at the end of June at City Field. And then, of course, these past two evenings in the Bronx inside Yankee Stadium, including J.J., yesterday in the fourth and final game this season between these two Big Apple foes. 12 to 3, the victory for the Mets against Garrett Cole and the Yanks. Five home runs launched by the Amazons yesterday, two off the bat of Francisco Lindor. What worked so well for the Mets last night? And I guess you could say all season long against the Pinstripes. Listen, their lineup, it's deep, top to bottom. And I think we've seen that kind of transformation within the Mets. The minute they put Francisco Lindor in the leadoff spot, they put Brandon Nimmo in the two spot. They found some answers at the bottom of the order. You just compare and contrast what the Mets are able to do from an offensive standpoint up and down their lineup and look at the Yankee lineup where Luis Severino is looking like Nostradamus basically proclaiming all you got is two guys in the lineup. I I don't know who's going to argue and who's going to fight with Luis Severino on that take because that's exactly what the Yankees do have. It's two guys in the lineup and everybody else flat out stinks. So I think in these four games, and you saw the way the Mets pounded Garrett Cole, really disappointed in Cole last night. I thought he'd give you a big effort. I thought he'd avenge that last terrible start he had against the Mets. You could argue he's even worse in this game that he pitched Wednesday night at Yankee Stadium. But just 
the overall top to bottom lineup depth that you see from the Mets, it's there and it's clearly not with the Yankees. John, if we look from a Yankees perspective, you tweeted out last night, 11 and 23 since Father's Day weekend, unwatchable, pathetic baseball in the Bronx. How did we get to this point? Everything was looking so good for so long. That's a great point. And I think it's a variety of different things. You look at their lineup, guys who were producing early in the year stopped producing. Anthony Volpe, now he's been better since the All-Star break, but his numbers went in the tank. Alex Verdugo. Remember Alex Verdugo hit that big home run in Boston? Mm -hmm. He's flexing around the bases. I, I think maybe he has five hits since that particular point in time. Gleyber Torres, who you see right there, really hasn't gotten going all year. And the Yankees are missing Stanton. So I think all of those elements are in play within their lineup. Their bullpen is not particularly deep. It doesn't have guys that get and produce swing and miss stuff. But the rotation, the rotation the first two months of the year – when the Yankees were firing on all cylinders, was phenomenal. Every guy was pitching great. There was inevitable regression. And I think the thought was going to be, hey, some of these other guys are going to regress a little bit, but you're going to get Garrett Cole back. And all of a sudden, Garrett Cole is going to counter that. So lineup not producing, bullpen not having swing and miss, and a rotation that has just gone completely in the tank, that's how you have a record that's resembling the likes of the Anaheim Angels and the Chicago White Sox over the last 45 games. 8-16 and 16 for the New York Yankees since before the start of the first subway set in Queens at the end of June. JJ, when you look at this series, the four games that were played this year between the Yanks and the Mets, because it is the inner city rivalry, because these, twos are, uh, these two clubs are often compared here in the greater New York City area, does the season sweep? for the Mets add on an additional level of significance because it was against the Yankees on both sides? Uh, I think it's bragging rights. You're going into work on whatever it is Thursday and you're a Mets fan, you can pound your chest a little bit. If you're a Yankee fan, you got to kind of put the tail between the legs. Um, that That's the beauty of the Subway Series. I, I think as far as the overall significance, look, the Mets need every game imaginable. You know, the Mets are in this tightly congested National League wildcard race, and these are big games for them because every game, quite frankly, is a big game for them. And for the Yankees, all of a sudden now, they're, what, a game and a half back of the Orioles. They're lucky it's not worse because the Orioles have not yeah. played particularly great over the last month to six weeks. Uh, but their wild card position has gotten a little bit more tenuous as you see teams in the Central making moves. The Astros have made their move. So... I think that more so is that element. Uh, for the teams, these games mean a lot. The bragging rights, hey, that's that's part for the course. You live in New York City. It's always going to be entertainment watching these two teams go after, but also it's interesting to see like the sort of the collision of their season. The Yankees sort of falling off a bit here, but the Mets making a resurgence here. We call them the Grimace Mets since now they unveil Grimace, 25 and 11 since June the 12th. Similar to what we talked about with the Yankees, like what's going wrong with them? What's actually going right for the Mets? How are they finding their footing now? They're scoring runs. They score runs on a consistent basis, guys. You just saw that graphic you guys put up a few minutes ago. You score five and a half to six runs a game. Yeah. You're going to be in a whole lot of baseball games. And I, I think the Mets have their flaws. You know, I think their rotation has kind of been, you know, patchwork all year and they figured out ways to make it work. Uh, I think their bullpen has some serious issues. Edwin Diaz has not found the form that he had two years ago when he was the best closer in all baseball. But listen, I think the Mets easily walked the part of a team that's playoff worthy. Now, this stuff changes in baseball. You're going to ride the roller coaster a ton over the next few weeks. And the Mets have a big series starting tonight against the Atlanta Braves as far as that National League wild card race is concerned. But I think they look the part of a playoff team. I really do. I think I've seen enough now from the Mets who had that Vegas number of what, 81 and a half, 80 and a half, give or take at the beginning of the year. I think they're going to go over that. I think they're going to have a winning record. And guys, when it's all said and done, I think they find their way in the playoffs. I do. Yeah, back in the middle of June, it was a plus 500 price for the Mets to see the postseason. 
Now it's minus 102 with New York in the second of three National League wildcard spots as of this moment after the Subway Series sweep. However, it's a very competitive race for those final two spots in the NL wildcard. JJ, back to the New York Yankees. Despite the struggles here in the last month, the Yanks remain the favorites to win the American League from the odds perspective. Plus 250, half a dollar in front of the Baltimore Orioles. In your estimation, in your mind, are the Yankees still the team to beat when all is said and done in the AL? Absolutely not. And I don't want to dis- disrespect our odds makers in any way. They know a lot more <laughs> than I do, and they have their formulas and their algorithms or whatever. How can you watch the Yankees and sit there and tell me they're the favorites in the American League? They got two guys that hit in the lineup. They got 10 zillion questions. Baltimore is younger, more dynamic. And oh, by the way, they have more prospect collateral to go and trade here at the deadline. Yankees go and match up with the Astros. How are you going to sit there and tell me that the Yankees are going to go and beat the Astros when they never beat the Astros when it counts? I think you're getting a Yankee tax at this particular point in time because of the brand and because of the uniform and because of the fact that you're going to have a lot of Joe Public folks going to bet the Yankees. Respect the odds makers. I think they are certifiably insane for pricing the Yankees as the number one favorites in the American League. I'm sorry. Yep. John Yastrzemski, I would have to agree with you. The Astros yep. moving up the board. Now the third best number at six to one. Five days until the MLB trade deadline this upcoming Tuesday on July 30th to make some maneuvers all around the bigs. John Yastrzemski, the host of New York, New York with the Ringer and Spotify joining us here on Thursday on the early line. JJ, we appreciate the time as always. Enjoy the rest of your day. You got it, guys. Anytime. Thank you. An eight-game slate around Major League Baseball. We have broke down some of the games so far. The rest of our daily plays and best bets on the other side of the break here on TEL. As of July 22nd, we start a new deal with a monster distribution platform called Sports Grid. And we'll be live every day on national radio on Sirius XM channel 159. And we will be live on their national television uh, platform every day from 10 a.m. till noon. Only on Sports Grid. If this wind like we have out of the Northwest was here all week, uh, was here, it would be insane watching these guys play in it. But it's going to be a Southwest wind, which makes it a little easier uh, as far as the direction of the wind. The guys um, will have it a little bit of a break on the back nine. But it is such a fun golf course, one that I really do think tests every single aspect of your game. Only on Sports Grid. Sacramento with the King, Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, Devin Carter, who they drafted early, Keegan Murray as well. A Kings team, DRS, that has been a playoff contender. Is it going to equate to a championship? Probably not. That's not the goal. Make your team better every offseason. The Kings definitely got better with that move here, Ben. The early line, only on Sports Grid.
Only eight games on this Thursday Major League Baseball slate, but we break them down for you in Donnie's final segment of this Thursday on the early line. The money line coming up at 11 a.m. Eastern time on Sports Grid Radio. A couple of midweek sets continue for a fourth and final game in L.A. as we shared between the Dodgers and the Giants. Clayton Kershaw's season debut at the Ravine. Also the case in Cleveland. The Guardians hosting the Tigers for the fourth and final game of this set. Cleveland has won the last two. Looking for a series victory on this Thursday. Booked as the heavy favorites to make that a reality at minus 166. Yesterday, DRS, a 2-1 final. It was Josh Naylor with an RBI single scoring his brother Bo Naylor. That was the game-winning run late. Seven and a half the total today. Might we see more offense or we stay under once again in the land? Something has to give today because the Cleveland Guardians offense hasn't been that great. Left-handed pitchers, right-handed pitchers, Ben, it doesn't seem to matter here. You take a look at Kenta Maeda. If we have 13 pitchers on the card today, because once again, it's a short card, past 60 days, minimum of 20 innings pitched. Kenta Maeda is 11th out of 13 pitchers with a 108 XFIP minus, which isn't terrible, but also an ERA accompanying that, if you like that metric, 8.33 over the past 60 days. If you're looking at his non-analytical numbers, which means what has actually happened to him at the plate, his last 80 batters, a 274 ISO, elevated. A 437 weighted on base percentage, elevated. But here's the issue. You take a look at Martinez batting in the two-hole today, a 178 ISO and a 329 weighted on base percentage. They're not marginally above average here. You take a look at Junkenzi Noel, 269 ISO power, number 373 weighted on base percentage. He might be the best of it in that lineup. And then Bo Naylor in that nine hole here, how many bats is he going to get? He actually has elevated ISO and weighted on base percentages. But you notice who we're leaving out here? Stephen Kwan's got terrible numbers over the past 30 days against right-handed pitching. Jose Ramirez, terrible numbers there. Will Brennan, really bad numbers at this point here. So it's one of those where do you just say to yourself, he's a bad pitcher, and eventually that Cleveland lineup is going to get up for him or not? Flip it over to the other side. Gavin Williams, average pitcher here, and I like the look of that Detroit lineup much, much better yeah. than I do for the Cleveland Guardians. We wouldn't have been saying that, Ben, before the All-Star break, but now it looks like that team is finally starting to wake up. This is a tough game, but the one yeah. thing I do know is that price point, 178's a tough one. Might is a bad pitcher, but I can't lay 178 with Gavin Williams out there. No way. Rubber, rubber match in an American League East divisional duel today. The Blue Jays hosting the Rays. Tampa won the first game 4-2. to two. The Blue Jays respond yesterday 6-3. to three. By the way, Vladdy Jr., he has been a part of trade speculation. Home run yesterday, two RBIs, mm-hmm. batting near 300 this year, has looked pretty good. Minus 116, Toronto a slight home favorite in the six to take the rubber match. Will the Jays do that? I'm not sure. I don't think they have the better pitcher on the mound today. Take a look at Taj Brad, who's really set it up here. Last 60 days, if we include home and away splits, an 83 XFIP minus and an ERA of 2.20. Couple that with a 3.41 XFIP number. He's really handling his business. Also, take a look at the non-analytical numbers here. ISO power number 023, weighted on base percentage 195. Through his last 96 batters, that is absolutely tremendous. Not a great-looking lineup outside a few batters here for Toronto. George Springer's got some really good numbers against right-handed pitching over the past month. And as you said, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., last 79 at-bats against right-handed pitching, Ben. 338 ISO, 423 weighted on base percentage. Certainly doing damage with the rest of that lineup. A lot to be desired. If I'm looking from Chris Bassett's angle here, he hasn't had a bad last 30 days. 103 batters he's faced, a 109 ISO, which is very good, and a 333 weighted on base percentage, which is average. And quite frankly, you only have to be average typically, Ben, when you're taking on the lineup for the Tampa Bay Rays. So maybe an under look might be the best side of it because I really like Taj Bradley. I just don't have an offense I'm getting out of Tampa Bay. So let's lean on an under today. The Rays 51 and 51 since the start of July. The Rays have never been better than a game above 500 or worse than two games below 500 hovering in mediocrity. Speaking of mediocre, it's an insult to the word mediocre to refer to that as the White Sox, who have now lost 10 straight games, are 50 games below 500 with a 27 and 77 record today in Texas, where they got blown out yesterday 10 to 2. The Rangers and Max Scherzer, nearly a two and a half dollar favorite. Scherz thing, like a sure thing, is Texas going to run away with another victory today mm. over Chicago? 
Now, yesterday, when you tell somebody your favorite RBI prop of the day is going to be Corey Seager, and in the first inning against a certain pitcher, you could say he's showing off, or, hey, Donnie, you were flexing, you're flexing. Hey, 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 there it is. Flexing an easy <laughs> home run shot. But what if I would have told you now, analytically, the better pitcher on the mound is not Max Scherzer. You would normally see that price, Ben, and say to yourself, of course, it's Max Scherzer going up a guy I never heard of here. Well, take a look at Max Scherzer over the last 60 days. His XFIP minus number, a 104. Jonathan Cannon, a 100. But as always, the issue is, what am I getting out of that Chicago White Sox lineup here? If you tell me right now, like, yeah, Scherzer's been bad. We can abuse him a little bit, get four to five runs. They would be in it. But isn't that the question mark? Like, if Scherzer goes out five innings pitched and three earned runs, I don't think anybody's saying, like, yeah, that's going to be a W here for the Chicago White Sox. That's the tough part here. I actually would lean more towards an over in this game than I would an under and more towards a side. Not necessarily, because I'm not paying that price on Max Scherzer. This isn't 2016, Max Scherzer. Come on. I like the look, DRS, in Miami. Can the Marlins yeah. complete the sweep oh, yeah. of a no, three-game no. midweek set against Baltimore? Can't happen, right? The O's are greater than a $2 favorite. The ace of the staff, Corbin Burns, is on the bump. Like This is it, right? Baltimore's not yeah, going to get swept yeah. today in South Florida. An XFIP number last 60 days, 88 XFIP minus for Corbin Burns, which is very good. Rodery Munoz, ready for this one, Ben? A yeah. 148 xfip minus number so when you're going into a game where it's decided advantage for one pitcher absolutely they should win but also this lineup should be able to absolutely tee off on munoz who cannot get left-handed batters out henderson rutschman santander o'hearn kirstad colser calser and mullins all left-handed batters which means if you could do simple math only two batters in that lineup are righties those seven lefties are live they should smash today in the afternoon right at noon yeah i think they should baltimore needs it win a game and extend your lead in the american league east at least to go two games up over the yanks drs we appreciate the time as i'm treating you like a guest all right i'll see you tomorrow friday 8 a.m eastern time here on the early line money line starts in just a few i didn't even hear what you said ben's college corner next As of July 22nd, we start a new deal with a monster distribution platform called Sports Grid. And we'll be live every day on national radio on Sirius XM channel 159. And we will be live on their national television uh, platform every day from 10 a.m. till noon. Only on Sports Grid. If this wind like we have out of the Northwest was here all week, uh, was here, it would be insane watching these guys play in it. But it's going to be a Southwest wind, which makes it a little easier uh, as far as the direction of the wind. The guys um, will have it a little bit of a break on the back nine. But it is such a fun golf course, one that I really do think tests every single aspect of your game. Only on Sports Grid. Sacramento with the King, Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, Devin Carter, who they drafted early, Keegan Murray as well. A Kings team, DRS, that has been a playoff contender. Is it going to equate to a championship? Probably not. That's not the goal. Make your team better every offseason. The Kings definitely got better with that move here, Ben. The early line, only on Sports Grid.
Listen, I would feel bad leaving out the eighth and final game for us to break down today in the MLB slate, even without the XFIP or WOBA numbers of my co-host, Donnie Wright's side. That game out in Anaheim tonight. It's the Angels and the A's. They opened up the second half following the All-Star break against one another. Oakland taking two of three. But the Angels bounced back. They won the final game of that set against Oakland. They swept Seattle this week. The Angels on a four-game win streak. The A's are four and two since the All-Star break. Good baseball despite being the two worst teams in the American League West. Minus 112 for LA tonight. Minus 104 on the other side for the A's. A total of nine and a half. That's the baseball breakdown you will get out of me. Third and final day in Indianapolis for Big Ten media days the reigning national champs albeit with a very new coaching staff and roster will take the podium today Sharon Moore as the new head man in Ann Arbor for the Michigan Wolverines will be at the podium defensive coordinator Wink Martindale that might ring some bells from his NFL ties the Giants DC last year the Baltimore Ravens for a long time he's the new defensive coordinator in Ann Arbor back to the Big Ten championship odds on this final day in Indy of Big Ten media days because a ton of teams in the middle of these top 10 prices were on stage yesterday James Franklin and Penn State I'll make a point on the Nittany Lions in just a moment Lincoln Riley and USC at its first ever Big Ten media days Lincoln had a lot to say a 25 to 1 number on the Trojans all Iowa does is win at least eight games in a football season, win total seven and a half. The Hawkeyes, one of five programs nationally at the FBS level in each of the last eight full college football seasons to win at least eight games, 33 to one. In Nebraska, entering year number two under Matt Rule, a 60 to one number. Now, I always have optimism in the Cornhuskers, dating back to my time in Omaha. But I believe in Matt Rule as a program builder. Look at what he did, year one to year two, at every one of his head coaching stops in college football. At Temple, at Baylor, resurrecting that football program in Waco and what I expect him to do this year in Lincoln. Seven and a half to win total for the Huskers as well. The under has the juice. The over juice of the seven and a half win total for the Iowa Hawkeyes. History and trends would tell you it's as safe of a bet as you will find in the Big Ten. Iowa's thing, of course, is offense. Can it be better? Does it even matter in terms of winning football? Nine starters return for a Hawkeyes defense that was one of the best nationally in the sport last year, including the nation's leading tackler in Jay Higgins. Much of the secondary is back. Quinn Schulte at the safety spot. Jamari Harris, one of their lead corners, and Sebastian Castro, as good of a utility DB as you will find. And Rhett Lewis was here yesterday, making the point about how divisions have been scrapped from the Big Ten And how despite the Big Ten West being the weaker of the two, this new format might actually benefit Iowa and Nebraska if they can make a run given where their schedules are. Can they actually contend by the time we reach the final month of the regular season in November of cashing those tickets at a 33-1 to or 60-1 to price to win a Big Ten title? I'll tell you this. I think those two numbers on the Hawks and the Huskers are both shorter by the time they play each other in the Heroes Trophy game on Black Friday in the regular season finale. Now to Penn State. It's year number 11 for James Franklin in Happy Valley. Outside of Kirk Ferentz, he is the second longest tenured head coach consistently. Greg Schiano has been at Rutgers for nearly a decade and a half, but in the same tenure in all of the Big Ten. You want to know who I think benefits most? from the uh, getting rid of divisions in the Big Ten, it's Penn State. The last two years, the Nittany Lions have suffered two regular season losses, and that has come against both Michigan and Ohio State. The Nittany Lions do not have to look up at the Buckeyes or the Wolverines this year. They just need to be good, and believe me, they will be. A great defense returns if Drew Aller can take a step as predicted at the quarterback spot in State College. Penn State will contend for a Big Ten title, and they have no choice but to do that. 
If Penn State does not make the college football playoff in the expanded 12-school format, there will be many questions to be answered about the ceiling that James Franklin can bring the Nittany Lions in Happy Valley. One final day on the early line this week, Friday, 8 a.m. Eastern time. We'll talk to you tomorrow.